say it's extremely gratifying to see so many people here today uh, for, for the Learning Portfolio Showcase. And so as well, I know there's much been going on already. I want to say words for me by way of welcome uh, to all of you uh, to the showcase. Um, and I also know that Asha provided you with uh, some background on the development of the learning portfolio uh, in his opening remarks this morning. I just thought I would share a few thoughts of my own about the progress of, of this initiative. It's been extremely gratifying uh, to watch the way in which the learning portfolio has progressed uh, here at Reverser from a brainstorming discussion which uh, was very exciting at the time uh, amongst a committed group of individuals um, who inspired, I mean, yes, in part, some of this was triggered by the, the Port of the Integrity Letter and the subsequent discussions, but really inspired by the model of uh, rethinking uh, the, uh, the education of our students in a more personalized, individualized way. Uh, and now we're at the point at which the learning portfolio has become a major university initiative, uh, and I'm utterly delighted about it. Particularly when one thinks about what it is we're all here to do, which is to, to work with the students who, who come here as individuals, to be sensitive to their, their unique abilities, talents, and interests, uh, and to help them realize the potential that's inherent in, in those things. Um, there's, there's nothing more exciting to me. And when one thinks of the way in which the portfolio works, it provides an opportunity for students to set their own goals for their, their, their immediate future, but also their long-term uh, plans, uh, and to reflect on those, uh, those long-term plans so that they can begin not only to identify those things which are most meaningful to them in, in terms of their personal development, but to have a realistic and thoughtful uh, understanding of where it is they're headed. So I'm really looking forward to the coming years as we uh, uh, move further with this initiative and I, I look forward to the day when the learning portfolio is universally used across campus in, in uh, uh, many different ways as there are disciplines uh, and approaches. So to help us imagine how we might do this, uh, We've invited our guest, Dr. Randy Bass, to be with us here today and to share his thoughts on portfolios in higher education. Randy is Vice Provost for Education and Professor of English at Georgetown University. Uh, for 13 years, he was the founding executive director of Georgetown's Center for New Designs in Learning and Scholarship, where he continues as a senior scholar for pedagogical research. Randy has been working at the intersections of new media technologies and the scholarship of teaching and learning for 20 years, including serving as director and principal investigator of the Visible Knowledge Project, a five-year scholarship of teaching and learning project involving 70 faculty on 21 university and college campuses. From 2003 to 2009, Randy was a consulting scholar for the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, where he served as a Pew Scholar and Carnegie Fellow. In 1999, he won the EduCause Medal for Outstanding Achievement in Technology and Undergraduate Education. And is the author and editor of numerous books, articles, and electronic projects, including recently, Disrupting Ourselves, The Problem of Learning in Higher Education. And he's currently a senior scholar with the American Association for Colleges and Universities. So Randy's title today is Designing the University for 2030, Learning Portfolio as a Catalyst for Change. Please join me in welcoming Brandon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Dean and Arshad for, and Laura for inviting me. Uh, it's very exciting to be here at this moment and to be with such an energetic crowd. Uh, thank you also very much to the panel, if any of you are still here. Um, uh, that was just absolutely the most perfect uh, uh, first session and will uh, resonate, I hope to resonate many times with, with the panel. Um, so I do want to start by thinking about the year 2030, um, which seems farther in the future than 16 years seems ago, right? <laughs> Of course, I always say this to my students. I say, you know, wow, 20 years in the future seems much longer ago than 
20 years in the past, you know, like 1994, that seems just like yesterday. And of course, they're 19, so they're like, <laughs> well, <laughs> not exactly, but uh, in a sort of being kind to older people way, we get what you're saying. Um, <laughs> But so I think a lot about like the year 2030, 2033, and I'll tell you why uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that one of the things that I'm doing at Georgetown as Vice Provost for Education is running an initiative in behalf of the President and Provost called Designing the Futures of the University, in which we're asking our entire community, students, faculty, staff, and alumni, um, to help us design the University of 2030. But I think it's worth kind of thinking about ahead to 2030, which again is not that far away, uh, to try to think about what, what kind of place are we trying to be? And this is, of course, what is really the essence of the whole forward with integrity uh, plan and movement, et cetera. Um, so I thought we would look back a few years, uh, comparably. <laughs> um, so this is an exact quote, quotation, um, and it was said, um, by the, the head of the largest educational funding agency uh, in the United States, what was known as FIPSI, the Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education, in our Department of Education. And uh, I always knew um, that the American Studies Crossroads Project, which I directed and was my first big web-based project and was funded by FIPSI, I always knew that that, that project was the first ever web-based project that our Department of Education had ever funded. What I didn't know until a month ago when the project manager came up to me after a talk was that that's what Buddy Corrales, the head of the agency, said when she presented my proposal to him for approval. <laughs> so I think it's worth sort of pondering that it only took 20 years to get from what the hell, it's again, a direct quotation, so <laughs> forget that. Um, <laughs> Uh, only 20 years to get from what the hell to, you know, everybody out there tweeting and checking their iPhones and our, our, our lives being fundamentally changed, certainly especially fundamentally changed outside the university. And if you think about the 20 years since 1994, you think about the second half of those, or the recent half of those 20 years, the last 10 years, 2004, right? 2004 is the Google IPO. 2004, Facebook is created, right? 2005, YouTube launch launches, right? So the second half of those 20 years, think about what has changed just in those 10 years, okay? So if we think forward now to 2030, then, this, th then we have to take this kind of accelerated pace of change into account. And what, we, what I like to think about, and, and I'll give you another uh, reason for this in a second, is to think about what we're trying to design for here is not the content of the curriculum, but the context. What is the context of 2030 for which we're designing the university? And you know, just take a minute. I mean, if I, you know, if I didn't have so much material to cover on student-centered learning, I'd actually have you talk to each other. But um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I have so much material to cover that I don't want you to talk to each other. But think for a moment, think for a moment, just like what, 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 what comes to mind when you think of the context of 2030? All right, we'll do something interactive. People just shout out. When you think 2030, what is that context to you? Just some people just shout out. Somebody shout something out. Scarcity of, inf probably not information though. Scarcity of everything else though. Scarcity of resources, the opposite of in terms of information. Mobile learning. Mobile learning, okay. Absolutely. I, I just actually read a funny line by somebody, uh, Michael Caulfield, who said, um, edu educational technology analysts have successfully predicted seven of the last zero revolutions in mobile learning. <laughs> but, um, anyway, sooner or later it's going to happen. I totally agree with you. So, yeah. No bricks and mortars universities. That's a bold prediction. Okay. Oceans of data. Oceans of data. Right, and oceans of oceans probably too. But yeah, oceans of data. Uh, yeah, technology even more integrated, more embedded. Uh, personalization. I mean, think about all the things in your lives now that are starting to personalize the present. You know, mention personalization of learning. Think of all the things in your lives that are now personalized, et cetera. 
So complex challenges, personalization, oceans of data, et cetera. So everybody has, we could, you know, construct the context. So the last couple of years I've been teaching a course, oh, those are dark, uh, teaching a course uh, called The Future of the University as a Design Problem. I've been co-teaching this with an architect who's really the brains behind this effort. And uh, Georgetown students get in teams and they spend the semester redesigning the University of 2033. It's been a fantastic course. But this is, this is basically what we ask them to say. First we set the context of what we think the context of 2033 is going to be like. And then we say, you know, well, what will the conditions of knowledge work learning be in 15 to 20 years, as best we can project. And then to ask, what kind of graduate do we want to produce for that context? What will it take for someone to thrive in that context? So there's a lot of things to read, think about, lots of things that we do in that course to build that context. One uh, interesting take on that is some work by these two economists from MIT, uh, Levy and Murnain who have been asking for many years, about a decade, but this is their new book. What is it that humans can do that computers can't? And what can computers do really well that humans can't? And then to ask in 20 or more years, what work will be left to humans? Right? And this is what they say, right? The human labor market will center on three kinds of work, solving unstructured problems, working with new information, which includes complex communication, and carrying out non-routine manual tasks. Other than that, they say, almost all the work will be being done by robots and computers, and then there will also be some super low wage jobs. But, but the, the heart of the labor market is gonna center on those skills, because computers are gonna be doing a lot of the rest of the work computers, robots, microprocessors. So the design question, right, and we, we, we called our initiative at Georgetown Designing the Futures of the University because we were trying to take this notion of disruption, which was, you know, filling the press, and flip that, right? So if you're, if you're thinking about disruption, if you're talking about disruption, then what you're, what you're talking about is can we stay who we are despite what's happening around us. That's a, that's a disruption conversation. If you're having a design conversation, then you're asking what is it we want to become? What is it we want to be? What kind of university do we want to be? So the design question is first, what kind of education is needed then at this moment in history, if that's where we're going, this is the context. But then even the more interesting design question, which is what we try to pose to our students, is what kind of education is uniquely possible at this moment? What kind of education, if we took the best of what we believe in of what we do and what's possible with these emerging conditions, what kind of education could only be possible now? What kind of liberal education um, or robust education or integrative education could only be possible at this moment in history? So that's, those are not easy questions for universities to ask. John Seely Brown, who's a well-known information theorist, et cetera, written many books about learning, right? We're primarily, especially around the curriculum, we're primarily built to look in the rearview mirror. Our curricula generally tell the story of our disciplines up to the moment in which the curriculum is being offered, right? We don't look forward very well. So I want to just, I have kind of three-thirds of my talk here, of which I'm well into the first one, just to assure you. Um, each third longer and more tedious than the one that preceded it. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I think. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes, you'll be the judge of that. I want to kind of talk a little bit more about the now as I see it. Then I'm going to do kind of middle third about portfolios. Then I want to think about sort of the, come back to the future, so to speak. So this is the first assertion I want to make, um, that our understanding of learning has expanded at a rate that has far outpaced our conceptions of teaching. And one could also say, and the structures of our, of our education, right? So what I mean by that? So, um, sorry, uh, we're like now 20 years into the official start date of the learning paradigm, right? In the mid-1990s, a couple of guys, Barr and Tag, wrote an article about, called From Teaching to Learning, which they kind of got everybody's attention that we were making this shift 
from an instructional paradigm to a learning paradigm, right? From inputs to outputs, from everything being all atomistic to instead trying to think around coherent designs, outcome-driven, student-centered, all the stuff that, you know, is filling the room today, right? They, they said at the time that, you know, it would take decades for higher education to make the full shift to the learning paradigm, right? Which is always a great move. Like you just say, I may be wrong, but, you know, I'll be dead, so it won't matter. But, um, but, you know, we're 20 years into it, and a lot has happened in those 20 years. They were pretty dead on. But that is now connecting with everything we know from learning research and cognition research, this tremendous sense of the expanding skill set, what we even mean by skills, and I'm going to come back to that. But so this notion of learning paradigm, focus on outcomes, expanding with this notion of what's the changing skill set, what do we know about learning, how people learn best, but those two things together then, to me, is that there's then this growing mismatch between our aspirations for learning and our structures. So let me explain that. This is a list that may be very familiar to you. This is a list that comes out of the National Survey of Student Engagement, which is, I don't, I don't know if you do Nessie here in Canada, but, you know, so thousands of institutions administer this to hundreds of thousands of students. It's been about 15 years, millions and millions of data points. And they have looked at what are the practices that are most closely associated with student success, student retention, um, graduation rates, et cetera, and which practices are most highly correlated within the NESI, which is all student self-report. So the students here, they're to blame for this. Um, in the NESI, it's correlated with student self-report to deep learning and integrated learning scales, okay? So these are what they call high-impact practices, right? And you can see first year seminars, collaborative writing, you know, et cetera, undergraduate research, internships, community-based learning, things that filled the language of the panel this morning. So where are these practices, right? Where are these high impact practices? So this is my map. When I, as vice provost, look out over my vast domain of the curriculum, this is what it looks like. I see the formal undergraduate curriculum in the center and what I would call the experiential co-curriculum around the margins. Right? So I've mapped the high impact practices. Half of them are in the marginal experiential co-curriculum and the other half are anomalous, like one-off, two-off experiences in the formal curriculum. Okay? So what I think is interesting about this map is we spend most of our money on the formal undergraduate curriculum. That's where we staff, et cetera, quite naturally. Most of the stuff around the outside is all underfunded on my campus, right? And yet, when I do focus groups, as I have done many times with first-year students, with fourth-year students, with alumni, and I ask them to talk about their most meaningful learning experiences, they will always mention one or two faculty and then talk the entire rest of the time about something that happened out there in the experiential co-curriculum. So I'd say we spend almost all our money in the middle. We actually invest a huge amount of our, what I would call, mission and brand around the perimeter. And in fact, evidence of that is if you go to like the Georgetown website, I don't know if this is the case at McMaster, you go to the Georgetown website, we have all these videos, right? And as I, as I often joke, I don't know why we have these videos there. I don't know who's looking at these videos, but we have all these videos on our website. There's this cartoon that's a Venn diagram that one circle says what universities put on their web page, and the other circle says what people are looking for on the university's web page. <laughs> and the only thing in this space where they intersect is the university's street address. <laughs> <laughs> so all the videos are mostly around the experiential co-curriculum. So anyway, so that's, that's an interesting part of the mismatch. Well, so the question about high impact practices then isn't necessarily just about those practices. Is well, what is it about high impact practices that makes them high impact, right? This is what we think we know. This has come out of the Nessie work and other related work, right? So these are the things that make high impact practices high impact. They're places where students feel like they're invested, where they're spending time on tasks, where they're spending effort, where they can engage in what Lee Schulman calls accountable talk, or, or you're giving and getting regular feedback, right? Or making daily decisions and feeling like you're making daily decisions that matter, 
or what I would say is judgments and uncertainty. Okay? They seem to be places where students feel like their perspectives and beliefs are challenged or where they can take risks or fail safely, operate outside a comfort zone. Right? And they're the places where students have the opportunity to integrate, synthesize, make meaning. This is what I hear over and over again. This is what comes out of the Nessie data. Right? This is what I think of as the new ecology of learning. So it's, it's those kinds of things as being really the critical edge of how people learn deeply and durably. And it's across formal and informal settings. And then you add to that kind of the ubiquity of learning information. That's the new ecology of learning. So one of the questions I started asking a few years ago was that if all the high impact practices are in the co-curriculum or anomalous in the formal curriculum, where are the low impact practices? So for a couple years I was giving a talk called Low Impact Practices, formerly known as the curriculum. <laughs> so, I, I have not given that talk at Georgetown, however. Sooner or later, one of these video versions is going to end up in the wrong hands among my <laughs> colleagues. I keep thinking this is a safe space. And it's not that there aren't really powerful courses, right? I ran a center for teaching and learning for 13 years. What we did was work with faculty to make their courses have more of those features, and many do. It's just that we don't really even think about that much, the difference between a low, medium, and a high impact experience in the formal curriculum. We essentially fund it all the same way except for the occasional, say, small seminar, et cetera. So it's interesting, if you look at that list of all those kinds of things that are being developed out in the co-curriculum, it starts to look an awful lot like a list that would probably support the things that's going to be left to human work in 20 years. The capacity to solve unstructured problems or engage in complex communications. So that's the new ecology for learning. And this is what I called in this article that I wrote a couple years ago, Disrupting Ourselves that we already know enough about how learning takes place to know that we're kind of getting in the way of ourselves. Okay, so that's kind of my sense of, that's my take on the now. See, that, that's like one third over. See, it's like, <laughs> it's like the YouTube thermometer running across the bottom, right? And you're like, oh, great. Would that, would that be good or bad if, like, for all speakers, you kind of had the little thing? It's like, really? <laughs> um, so I'm doing you a service by letting you know, like, where I am, just in case you have work to do. So let me turn to ePortfolios then. Uh, so what difference could ePortfolios make to the future of higher education, given that this is the now? So Arshad said it beautifully. Uh, I had to write it down, it was so beautiful. Maybe th this is something that's ahead of its time. Maybe somehow e -port learning portfolios, sorry, I'm gonna go, I've been calling them e-portfolios, so I actually prefer learning portfolios. I'm gonna go back and forth. Maybe, you know, learning portfolios are kind of difficult to grab hold of for a couple of reasons, but to me, you know, this is this famous William Gibson quote, also from 2004, interestingly. Um, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed, right? I think e learning portfolios in some ways are a kind of a place where we can spot the future, the, both the implementation, their whole broader ecology, and that's part of why it's kind of difficult to wrap our heads around, so it is gonna be messy. They are ahead of their time, or at least they're a bridge to this next phase. They're a bridge to this next paradigm. And here's a couple reasons why. So Trent Batson, who does a lot of work in portfolios, longtime collaborator and friend, um, made the very interesting observation, e-portfolios or learning portfolios are rare among innovations in that they're not really replacing anything, right? which is pretty interesting. Right? And most things that don't replace something don't stick around as innovations, right, in the history of innovations. That's usually, except, I would say, the thing about learning portfolios is they're helping institutions solve problems that we didn't have 30 years ago. They're helping institutions solve problems that we didn't even know we had 30 years ago. And you could look all, in all different places for that, what, how you, we want to try to link the curriculum and the co-curriculum, how we teach to this broader set of outcomes, the problem with accountability and assessment that's coming down from the government, our new focus on gen ed. I mean, there's all kinds of things that universities didn't talk about 30 years ago 
that are, that are now really pulsing underneath the surface of the structures that have been in place for a long time. E-portfolios help us solve those problems, and that's why, as an innovation that doesn't replace anything, they're, they're taking off in many places. I think they also sort of point us to the future in that they live in a very particular space that's very much of this century. Kathy Yancey talks about portfolios as living at the intersection of the three curricula where students live. Right? So there's the delivered curriculum. That's what we think we're doing. Then there's the experience curriculum. That's how students experience what it is we think we're delivering. Notice the small amount of intersection there. And then there's the lived curriculum, which is like the rest of students' lives. Right? E-portfolios live there, and they live there in a very particular way. Another quotation about them is that e-portfolios are fundamentally student-owned space. And there was actually one of the questions in the previous session was kind of getting at that. Like, and this is a very interesting difference that faculty, we're trying to get faculty and programs to design assignments to ask students to do, to put into a space that should be wholly theirs. That's a totally learner-centered space. So in that sense, it's, it's kind of bridging paradigms in a way we're not used to. Like either you're in my sphere or you're out in the co-curriculum, you're on your own. Either you're in my classroom or you're not in my classroom, right? This is a very different kind of hybrid space that to me speaks to the whole changing new ecology of learning. So for the last three years, I've been working on a project as a senior researcher called uh, Connect to Learning. And we just, uh, it, here's some of the stats, funded by FIPSI, funded by the what, Who Brought You What the Hell is the World Wide Web in 1994, Brought You Catalyst for Learning. Brett Einan, uh, LaGuardia Community College, the director. I was lucky enough to be one of the senior researchers. 23 United States universities have participated. About half of them are community colleges, and then a very good mix, state universities, broader universities, uh, Georgetown, Virginia Tech, Rutgers, some research universities. Uh, but a very robust consortium for three years. And we just published in January this huge site called Catalyst for Learning. Over 300 what we call polished practices of e-portfolio pedagogies, and a whole bunch of evidence and a whole bunch of framework essays. Um, available there. But if you just, on your very own Google machine, just put in Catalyst for Learning and ePortfolio, you'll surely find it. So we think over three years we can support three findings, three claims about, e about learning portfolios. Okay? These are our three claims. That they advance student learning and success, that they make student learning visible, which is productive of a number of things, and that they can catalyze institutional change. So let me just show you just some of how we support this. So here's the first claim. Sorry, I have to keep looking up. I don't, I don't have a computer here. So um, at a growing number of campuses with sustained portfolio initiatives, which is very important, e-portfolio practices correlate with higher levels of student success as measured by pass rates, GPA, retention, and graduation. We actually have data which is very rare in the e-portfolio literature. We actually have data from half of our schools that show significant learning gains from the students who use e-portfolios versus the ones who don't. So here's LaGuardia Community College, very significant um, uh, raise in pass rates from the students who are using e-portfolios. LaGuardia Community College, uh, one of the most advanced places using community colleges in the United States as a whole institution. Uh, this is Rutgers University, a small residential college program that adopted e-portfolios. Uh, move the average GPA up a third of a point across the board uh, for pre-portfolio and post-portfolio. Uh, Metro Academy, San Francisco State University, very diverse, challenging population in this program, uh, uses e-portfolios and a number of other things, significant gains in first-year retention, third-year retention, and fourth-year retention, and you can see what a challenging population this is, that that's a significant gain in fourth-year retention. Tunxis Community College in Connecticut, interesting findings that they not only showed higher spring to fall rates, but that the rates went up absolutely with the number of courses in which students had portfolios. So that's just a glimpse of the student success data. So one of the things we wanted to understand was, well, so why? Why, why do portfolios make a difference? Right? So we tried to administer our own survey. We built some e-portfolio questions onto the NESI 
and, had, and, and developed our own core survey within the project. Right? These are some of the things that students ranked very highly about what they got out of the e-portfolio. Help them make connections. Help them think more deeply. Help me more aware of my growth as a learner. Right? Synthesizing and organizing. Right? Contributed to my sense of personal development and understanding myself. Again, all the kinds of things that you heard on the panel. And not surprisingly, the kinds of things that we know are the characteristics of high impact practices. So then we also talk about how e-portfolios help make student learning visible, makes learning visible in ways that students can use it for their own learning and to share with others. Okay. Transform the learning experience, help construct purposeful identities as learners. One of the things we talked a great deal about in the project, and I heard some of it on the panel here, is that e-portfolios have to be treated as a social pedagogy. Right? They're not just about places where you put it individually or places where you share with your professor, that reflections have to be shared in a sense of community. Right? So social can mean all kinds of things, faculty feedback, student feedback, external audiences, building knowledge in a community, but that e-portfolios have to be social. Some of the data we got out of our course survey was absolutely astonishing. When we asked people about what they valued, right? I'm sorry that my slides are, the data is much more compelling if you can see it. So, <laughs> on the other hand, I'm much more believable if you can't actually see the data. You're like, wow, that sounds like a really big gain. I can't see that, but he sounds really excited. Um, so against some of the learning gains, so this was just one of those things I showed you from the slide before about the extent to which the e-portfolio helped me make connections between ideas. We cross-tab that with students who said they got a lot of feedback from their instructor, like they felt like their instructor was an audience, or only a little feedback, and the extent to which they felt their peers were audiences, or in which they didn't get a lot of peer feedback. And the, the difference in the extent to which each of the things that people found valuable, if it was in a social context, was extraordinary. Then other thing very powerfully is that e-portfolios make student learning visible to faculty. And the sophisticated initiatives that are actually using it to close the loop, where groups of faculty, whether it's in a whole program, like we heard in biology, is trying to think about it as a whole program, or stakeholders across the campus, student life stakeholders, advisors, sit down with the portfolios, that they can see something they can't see in any other way. Um, our faculty in the project say that it allows, looking at student full portfolios, allows them to see the institution whole in a way they've never been able to see it before. They're able to see student learning whole at that intersection of the delivered curriculum, the experienced curriculum, and the lived curriculum in a way they can't otherwise, which in turn then makes them realize they often need to th rethink their practices. And it's in that sense that it can catalyze institutional change. And we have a number of places that start to see that happening. So then institutional change for what? or institutional change why. For those of you paying attention, I'm now on my third third. <laughs> so I talked about disrupting ourselves, but there's still this notion of being disrupted by outside forces. Here's my brief history of higher education from the last three years. This is how it looks from the United States. I think probably, probably similar here. <laughs> so it was only three years ago in fall of 2011, it was just three years ago that Stanford University invented online learning, right? <laughs> right? You remember that? It was great. Nobody had ever thought of that before. Fall 2011, they invented online learning. It's really taken off since then. 
remember 160,000 people, Sebastian Thrun's uh, artificial intelligence course, right? So that was only fall 2011. Then for like 15 minutes, MOOCs were cool, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Remember that little moment? Then for like the next 18 months or so, 18 months to two years, all universities in the United States and the world really went extinct. All colleges and universities went out of business. You may have read about this in the New York Times or the Globe and Mail or whatever, right? But all of us just disappeared. All the dorms became condos. Everybody started getting a world-class education from Harvard and Stanford by sitting in their basements. All universities disappeared. That was for like two years. Then we started learning that actually like only nobody's actually finishing MOOCs and the whole thing in California kind of went south on Udacity and stuff. So then MOOCs were not cool and then MOOCs went extinct and then everything was fine. <laughs> so that is the brief history of higher education in the last three years. There's really nothing more to say. <laughs> so, but most people who track these things know or will say that technology is always overhyped in the short run and underestimated in the long run. So this is the Gartner's group famous hype cycle, right? This is the, that's the thing. So when MOOCs were cool and everything, that was the peak of inflated expectations. And then we went into the trough of disillusionment, right? And this is actually the, this is the hype cycle on top. This is the MOOC version of the hype cycle on the bottom. But as you can see, then there's this slow curve upward where it just begins to have greater and greater impact in subtler and subtler ways. And these to me are the, the key forces of disruption that are all around universities, despite the fact that we all wanted to dance on the graves of MOOCs in the last year, right? So, so we have the explosion of online education, especially from the elites, and I know you guys belong to Coursera, is that right? And so Georgetown's part of edX. Um, so this is, I'm engaging in what we like to call MOOC self-hatred, but, uh, <laughs> right? But then there's all this pressure from the government to have all these rankings of productivity that feel way too narrow and reductive for how we want to be rated, right? There's the explosion of, you know, companies like Newton and the huge explosion of startups, for-profits, and all these places that are now in the learning business, not necessarily in the university business. There's new universities, but also places in the Khan Academy, Code Academy, lynda.com, General Assembly. I mean, I could fill the screen with the logos of the places that are in the learning business of some kind. And then there's data analytics. Data analytics, um, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Uh, the whole world of learning analytics and data analytics and the way that learning has become personalized. But the point I want to make here is sort of my second assertion. It's kind of the corollary of the learning teaching assertion, which is that the great tension that we're working out right now is between integration and disintegration. Right? It's not between online and face-to-face. -face. It's not about scale. It's not about for-profit versus not-for-profit. It's a war between integration and disintegration, between a fundamentally integrative view of learning and a disintegrative view of learning. And, and where that especially was driven home to me was sitting in a series of these things. One of them was a couple years ago. It was in this 15 minutes when MOOCs were cool. I was at a meeting pulled together by the White House and the Department of Education, 150 educators in the crowd, like where you are, and up here is the head of edX, the head of Coursera, the head of Newton, the head of Straighter Line, the head of all these startups with no business model telling higher education that your business model is broken. <laughs> Thank you. It was slow, but I appreciate it. Saying things like, we want to be able to track learning to the nano level. We want to be able to, be, be able to track learning to the, to the sub-concept sub level, the atomic concept level. This is all about being able to get the data on learners, cycle it, you know, create environments, get data, cycle it back into the environments. This is the virtuous cycle of design and redesign. We want to make teaching a science that's built out of analytics. And this, said by the CEO of Newton, who has the largest recommendation engine in the K-12 sector, I have 150,000 data points on your students you don't have, right? which as an epitaph for this era, like says everything that's both 
e exciting, challenging, and like completely annoying about learning analytics. But what I realized sitting there, as I was sitting there thinking, I've spent my whole career at the intersections of technology and learning. Do I feel empowered or diminished by this conversation? <laughs> I ought to feel happy that everybody's now talking about this. What people are really after is this dream of the personalization of learning with data at scale. Right? So it's a way to break what people call, talk about the iron triangle of cost, access, and quality. But that the people on the panel, the parts of the discourse that give me and many of you the willies, right, <laughs> that make us nervous, they're part of the learning paradigm also. And this is what I've come to see is the split logic of the learning paradigm. This is why this is such a fundamental moment. Because there's a version of the learning paradigm that is 20 years old that want, is interested in learning, personalization, quality, outcomes-driven, competency-based, but it's oftentimes very discrete and granular learning experiences. And then there's a version of that that's into all the things you guys are into and forward with integrity is about. You're into competencies, but competencies in the context of a vision of education. Hundreds of millions of dollars of venture capital are pouring into that space. Hundreds of dollars are pouring <laughs> <laughs> into that space, right? Silicon Valley and Wall Street don't care about that space. Nobody's investing in that space. This space has to eat that space and put it to its purposes. So this is where e-portfolios and learning portfolios come in, which is, is in part, what is the future of an integrative vision of higher education? And this is where, as I want to kind of bring this home, what I call the re-centered curriculum, a kind of re-look at my big circles as, as, a, as a, what I think is going to happen to the curriculum. So you'll vaguely recognize the circles from before now overlapped. One of the things that I think has happened over this three-year brief history of higher education that I had joked about is that of the formal curriculum, the generic and interchangeable part of the formal curriculum has been exposed as generic and interchangeable. Everybody's teaching introduction to statistics. Every school in America is teaching principles of microeconomics. Right? That's what the MOOC, first MOOC wave at least made visible to us. Right? So the extent that that stuff is going to be available, whether it's through MOOCs or through Khan Academy or whatever, out in the environment, it's going to take a huge chunk of part of what we do that is generic and interchangeable and move a bunch of that out into some other space. At the same time, every university and every curriculum has a piece of it that is irreducibly local, right? So on the one hand, generic and interchangeable. On the other hand, irreducibly local, right? If Georgetown, we're in Washington, D.C., we're Jesuit and Catholic, we're diverse, we're residential, right? That's who we are. And so if I think about what is the most distinctive part of who we are, it's where the highest impact part of the formal curriculum overlays the most learning intensive, highest impact part of the co-curriculum. That's where our institutional brand and identity needs to be, and that's where our investment needs to be. Right? It's in that space where people learn to do things like engage other people, to think reflectively, to exercise judgment. That's where you train practitioners. Right? You don't train nurses online. You don't train teachers online. Right? You don't mentor research online. I mean, you can use online tools, but that's the space where you actually form human beings. Okay? That's the locus of integrative learning. And part of what's happening is around this changing skill set, which I mentioned before. So if we take knowledge out here, 
right? Always been really important. Last 20 years, 30 years have really been about the visibility of skills. That it's not just about knowledge, it's about skills, it's about literacies, it's about problem solving, critical thinking. We didn't talk so much about critical thinking and literacies more than 30 years ago, right? Last 30 years was the history of that column. I think the next 20 years is going to be the history of this column, right? These are the dispositions, the character traits, empathy, grit. Everybody's talking about grit now. Grit is apparently a new black. I guess grit was always black, but um, <laughs> resilience, risk taking, curiosity, well being. This is the column that people annoyingly, and I have been one of those people in the past, call soft skills, right? <laughs> I'm gonna, I've, I just yesterday had a great conversation at Waterloo where I was yesterday. I'm gonna start calling this column differentiating skills, <laughs> right? Two people have equal amounts of this. The thing that differentiates them is what they've got in that next column, right? right? All based on whatever you wanna put down on this values level, right? This is what I'd put coming out of Georgetown, probably a lot of agreement. But what we're trying to produce, people who know content, know how to do things, can make judgments, have a sense of well-being, have a sense of global citizenship, right? That really builds off of that end and backward to this end, which is really a flip around of the way we've built our universities. Because our universities were built, you start here and you hope people come out with that stuff. So, to me, this is what we have to think about what we're designing for in this curriculum, right? It's at least three things that we've never really focused on as the, our primary purpose. This list of developmental outcomes that embeds knowledge and skills in this larger set of capacities. Helping students from the very beginning engage in what it means to create knowledge, engage in knowledge communities, work on unstructured problems, engage in social learning. And then what some people, like Marsha Baxter McGolder, have called self-authorship. Help students really just develop a sense of who they are. Move inward and outward at the same time. And just real quickly, by self-authorship, this, this is something we found that e-portfolios do at every level. There was a question in the last panel about graduate students. So this is a first-year student at LaGuardia Community College child of immigrant parents. Through my e-portfolio, I learned how to express myself as a hardworking student. Being a shy girl it was always an issue for me. E-portfolio helped me see a new me, the potential I have as a student that I want to accomplish in my life. So that's first year student, et cetera. But at Georgetown, one of our programs using e-portfolios, our master's program in communication, culture, and technology, Janine Turner, has her students basically building portfolios to go out and get a job coming out of the master's program, she realized they don't know who they are. They don't know what their story is. She's built a whole section of her course. What's your story? How are you going to tell your story to others? And last, great article published by someone out of the project called Are We Who We Think We Are? Where a whole master's program in education at Northeastern University sat down with a whole set of student portfolios from the master's program and said, my God, these are our students? First of all, they had a 10-year-old sense of like even who their students were, where they came from. And their students were not expressing a sense of professional identity at all like they wanted. So as she says, we completely redesigned our program from a master's program where we bolted on the portfolio to rethinking our whole program as an integrated program where the portfolio gets built at every stage. To me, this is the design challenge for places like McMaster, places like Georgetown for the next 20 years. What does it look like to design a university that's optimized, or at least the educational enterprise, that's optimized for that? In order to make that happen, or to design for that, we obviously need a lot to happen in addition to learning portfolios, but it's hard to imagine achieving that without something like learning portfolios, that's a mechanism for integration and a mechanism for allowing people to see learning whole. Students, staff, faculty.
So now I'm in my coda. My wife calls this my closing voice. So our president kicked off our initiative, Designing the Futures, with a talk, a lot of resonance with Forward with Integrity, in which he says that universities have three core functions. The formation of men and women, the creation of knowledge, and serving the public good and the common good. Obviously very resonant. But he particularly made the point to say it's not just that universities do these three things, it's that they do these three things in a way that they're completely interlocked. That it matters that we form men and women in the company of who we'll call students, in the company of other men and women who we'll call faculty, who have devoted their lives to a particular kind of inquiry. And that that inquiry is done in the name of the common good. So there are other institutions in our culture that do research, but not necessarily in that context. And there's other institutions in our society that provide formation, but not in that context. And then in turn, that shapes how we form men and women. So when we think about the future, make one more gesture back to the past. There's this saying out of American studies, which was sort of my field, that in the 19th century, the railroads that thought they were in the railroad business went out of business. And the railroads that figured out that they were in the transportation business survived. So the challenge for universities is to figure out what business are we in? What's our version of the transportation business? Probably something like we're in the formation business or the integration business or the transformation business. Because one thing's for sure, if we think that we're in the content business or the basic skills business, by 2030, we're going to have a lot of competition. Thank you. <laughs>